Hi, everyone. Welcome to this month's Q&A. It's been a month. <laughs> Lots have happened. And I hope that everybody has had a wonderful long weekend. We've got lots of people from the crew here. Uh, we've got, sorry, I'm just getting all my windows together. Got to get the chat up. Oh, we've got Barbara and Maple Country and Marlene from the crew in, in the house. We've got lots of people from all over. Some people from the UK. Jane, welcome. Look at people from New York. <laughs> Oh boy, Hamilton, Ontario. Well, that's Barb. <laughs> Michigan, right across the way. Helen from Montreal. I'm heading to Montreal next weekend. I have been invited by the Montreal Modern Guild to go on a shop hop with them. And it's hard to believe, but I, it's a big city about five hours away from Toronto, but I have never been fabric shopping in Quebec. So I'm going to change that this weekend. <laughs> going to hang out with my uh, my daughter, and my grand dog, and her new husband, and uh, then we're going to hit the stores with my new friends. So, um, lots have happened since I saw you last. Uh, I've just made uh, a new video um, to do with paper piecing. And before I forget, let me just find it here, find the link for you. Nope. That's it. Uh, let's go with thumbnails here. Here, if you haven't um, downloaded it yet, I have this free pattern um, available for you. Um, just download it. I have been making it like you cannot believe. It's a fun little thing. Um, you can do it with a fall theme. You can do it with a Christmas theme. You can do it just as a, a country theme. Um, and you can make it out of scraps. So if you download the 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 pattern, there's a little QR code there that will take you directly to the paper piecing video. So um, yeah, let me turn these all off. Um, I'm also getting my feet wet in the fabric <laughs> selling fabric online. I did a class. I taught a workshop many years ago. Um, just before COVID on my Stash Buster number one, and I had all sorts of fabric kits for it. So um, I'm just going to show you what they are. Um, they, the kit comes with everything but the batting and the backing. So it, that is the border and the binding fabric. And then it comes with seven fat quarters and two fat eights. And if you're looking for them, they're on eBay. They're on my husband's um, website. And I've, I've, there's a couple left. I had offered them up to members of my crew first, but we do have a couple left and then just some smaller fat quarter bundles. And if you are into STEM or chemistry or science, these are just gorgeous fabrics. And that's it for that. <laughs> Maybe I'll interview you and uh, if you grab one and uh, talk about selling fabrics online and you can tell me about buying fabrics online. So Creative Minds has asked me, do you gift your quilts or do you keep most of them? When I started quilting, my idea was that I was giving all my quilts away. And I do try to give all my quilts away, but now I have this YouTube channel. I realize that I do need to keep some physical record of the of the quilts that I've made. So I've got a lot more than I have beds right at the moment, but I'm going to, I have some in my, in my quilt buffet that I think I've got about 50 that need to go off to the children, uh, the children's hospital. And I've got some that need to go off to a uh, foster kids program and a couple that I'm sending up to quilts for survivors. So I'm just about to do a clear out on that. But I try to make everything, everything have a home. Um, yeah, uh, there's some that I make just for me and I've had a, a lot of fun doing them, but I can even see those in some time, you know, just going, you know, I don't need this. I could 
I, I, I would prefer it to keep somebody else warm. So, but. Meredith Rodriguez has asked, what are your thoughts on Joann's or Walmart's fabrics? Do you think it's worth splurging on nicer brands? I do not buy Joann's or Walmart fabrics. I have bought some of Joann's fabrics. It just comes down to what you can afford. Like, I don't want to say that they're awful, never buy them, because if that's all you can afford, that's what you can afford. Um, but I find that they're very lightweight. I find the, the weave on them really heavy. And another area that manufacturers costs on is color fat fastness. So I would do your own experimenting with them, but certainly the fabrics from the big manufacturers like Moda and Riley Blake and uh, Andover, you know, they have very beautiful designs. They've got the money to pay the designers or um, to produce a line that coordinates together where Walmarts and Joann's are often just knocking those off. So they're kind of facsimiles of them. But um, if that's what you can afford, that's what you can afford. Another, if you're just looking for affordability, another good place to find good fabric is in men's dress shirts. You know, they go to the thrift store and grab some shirts that have been barely worn and they produce a good half yard of fabric. So Jane Spillett, I think it's Spillett, um, do you have any tricks or techniques to develop the habit of getting fabric together when making a quilt projects? In other words, how should I learn to make project quilt kits? Well, at the core of a kit is a pattern. So I often throw kits together when I just have some fabrics that I like. And when I go to make it, I can just figure out what pattern goes where. But sometimes I just do it for play. It's just a, an effort in experimenting uh, with color and the color wheel and playing with the different parts of the color wheel. So when you're making up a kit, what you're looking for is contrast. So if you're just new at it or um, you're just trying to build up some color confidence, I would take three core colors and then try to find something that's a little bit darker and something that's lighter in each one of them. And then see if you can find ones that also contrast in pattern. In my Stash Buster number two video, I showed you the process I went through with three different colors. And, you know, make some a little bit darker and you can make them darker through dye color. And you can also do that just through um, a very dense pattern, like a tone on tone. Um, and then there's the fabrics that add white, or they may actually be on a, on a, a tint or a more desaturated part of that color wedge. So that's where you start playing. And the wonderful things about kits is you haven't cut the fabric yet. If you put it together today and you think it works really well and you don't make it until next year and then you don't like it or you've got a new fabric that can go with it, you can always change it. So I really encourage playing with fabrics and making up those kits so that you, your eyes get better. You get better at doing it. And you also get a better idea of how to look for fabrics when you're shopping. Like just the other day, I went into my red, my orangey red basket and realized almost everything in that category that I had in that box was either the color with white or an off-white or it was a tone on tone. I don't have any bright fabrics that mix different colors together there, which is good in one way, but it also, also means, um, you know, I, I have a when I'm at a store, I'm attracted to a certain type of fabric to buy, but there's another one that I like to touch and look at. So it's a, it's a journey, it's an experiment. And as I say, the best thing about kits is that you haven't cut the fabric yet and they could easily go back in your stash if you change your mind. What is the largest quilt that I have made on my long arm? Well, my long arm is only 10 feet wide. 
Uh, so I think the largest that I've made so far is 96 inches. It, uh, queen size quilt. That probably was my 4th of July. It was probably my biggest quilt so far. Um, I do have my crumb quilt coming and I may, I'm going to put it on and I may be right at the ends of the, uh, the, the leaders and enders. Uh, I may have to call up wheels, <laughs> whirls and swirls and see whether I can borrow her machine for a day to do it. So Rolls Spelker has asked for her for the current quilt, I only have two inch strips available for my facing. Would you recommend folding it in half, resulting in a three quarter inch facing in the back, or use two folds a quarter of an inch, giving it a one and a half inch wide facing? So a facing is something where you don't see the binding on the front of the quilt. It's you sew it to the side and all of it gets folded over to the opposite side. And I think both of those are valid. It just depends on the look and feel that you would. If it's a facing, I would be more inclined to, um, to, to have it as flat as possible. I wouldn't have a bump in it. So I wouldn't do the, the double layer, but again, it's up to you. <laughs> and how you prefer to do it. Just just do a small section of it and see whether you like the feel of it. And if you do, continue with it. If you don't, um, back up and do it the other way. Hazel DW has asked me, how long did it take for me to acquire a stash? So I started quilting back in 2007 and I don't think I got a stash until 2017. I didn't really actively work on acquiring fabrics um, until then. And I was, I was around people that had enough fabric in their sewing spaces to start their own store. So when I look at mine, I realize I still don't even have half of what they had, but I, I always had it in my mind that when I wanted to start making a quilt, I really wanted to go to my stash and be able to pull the fabrics from there. If I was doing something scrappy or if I was making something for someone, I wanted to pull those fabrics from my stash. And it's not a 100% rule, but it's usually enough to get me going and I realize what I need to fill in. So I did a lot of acquiring between 2017 and 2020. And a lot of that was me just buying fat quarter bundles, <laughs> me having absolutely no willpower against them. And I went to a number of different shows where I bought a number of fat quarter bundles and I would pick up fat quarter bundles everywhere I went. Um, and that started pretty quickly. I also subscribed to a couple of subscription services. So my local quilt store, So Sisters, I subscribed to their Modus, uh, the Kona solid one and a cat, a calf facet one. Um, and then there was a company called, uh, Fridays off and I would buy a curated bundle. So that was from a number of different, um, lines. And I subscribed to hers because she chose colors that I would not pick. Um, she was picking them out of different lines and I thought it was a way to get fabrics into my stash that I would not normally buy. And it, it, it did a good job. It, um, there wasn't, I don't want to call them dogs or ugly fabric because it's all in the eye of the beholder, but there were some that I definitely did not like, and I've already thrown them into quilts. Um, but there's some that are just absolutely beautiful and some have been the ones that I've needed that I would never have bought on my own. So it's been, it's been fun. Sharon Crawford has asked, any chance of a destination retreat? I'm not into cruising. Well, um, I'm certainly, I'm doing a retreat with uh, Quilts for Survivors this coming September. Um, and I've had, I, don't ha I haven't been asked to do a number of retreats. It's too much for me to take on myself. And, but uh, retreats are nice. So. 
Christine Kranich, is there any way to come back from stretching a biased edge? If I were to accidentally stretch a square block while pressing and discover it's wonky, would it work to carefully remove all the stitches, gently hand wash, air dry, and reassemble? No. Once you stretch your bias fabrics, there's absolutely nothing you can do. You can uh, put them down and you can recut them, but unfortunately, once those um, once that bias gets stretched, it doesn't come back. And that's why you've got to be really careful not to do that swishing with your iron because, you know, you want them stable. And that's where starch also comes in handy. It helps stop them from going off grain. If you do stretch a block and you've got, you've got the right fabrics, I would just remake it. Just cut it out again and redo it. It's a beginner mistake. We all do it. <laughs> don't be don't be thinking that you're the only person that's ever done it. It happens all the time. Okay, so Gwen Jackson has asked, when you paper piece, how do you determine how to add the batting and backing and how to decide the quilt pattern? I think you're asking what how to quilt it. Well, you you choose a batting just the same way you would choose batting for any other quilt. Uh, you go with what you like and what you know how to use. For a quilt pattern, there's different different styles. Um, when I did my 4th of July, I was really stumped by a lot of it. And I was talking with Tracy from Whirls and Swirls, and she recommended me stitching in the ditch. And I ended up doing that for the majority of the quilt, and that worked. Uh, because you want your piecing to, to stand out. But normally what I do is I go online and find a quilt that has used the same pattern and see what other people have done. Uh, how does a pantograph work or how does uh, just straight stitch stitching works? I know a lot of people who have done just straight stitching and that works. So um I would go with a slightly lighter thread if you're going to do straight stitching on a on a paper piece pattern. Uh, go down to a 60 weight and try and choose a neutral color that works with your background. Yeah. But it's the way you would choose your pattern like any other other quilt. The, the tricky thing with paper piecing is that your your pieces are odd are not those common shapes that you quilt, but I've seen some paper piece patterns that are just, they've just done such an amazing job of the quilting, the custom quilting. Yeah. I, but in truth, I have not done a lot of them. <laughs> so I did, um, I did a number of, uh, what have I done? I've done straight stitching. I have done following the pattern. I've, experimented with uh, lines and circles and things like that. So I think every pattern is different. So try that. I would like to, uh, Nettie, I would like to know what you call the vine that is appliqued. That is a tube about a quarter of an inch thick. I think you're talking about um, uh, single single turn binding. Shannon Jackson has asked, do you enter quilts for shows? If so, any tips? I have not, I've only been part of uh, quilts that have been entered into shows. The real thing with shows is you, is you need to read the instructions because there's so many quilts that go into so many shows, they're looking for any excuse to disqualify people. So there's less work to do. Uh, in judging. So follow the rules, read them carefully, uh, get good pictures of your quilt done, and well, there's a couple, just follow the instructions. Uh, a lot of people miss the, the deadline to, to register them, so make sure you do that. Um, the photograph and follow the instructions. The other thing is sometimes you enter your quilt into the wrong category. So if you're, or it can possibly go into a couple of different categories. So 
there's some quilt shows that will move it for you and some shows will not. So you need to think about that too. Where are you likely to do better? Um, for instance, I have a really scrappy crumb quilt. I, that thing can go into traditional piece, but like modern traditional piece, it could go into scrappy and it could also go into the maxim maximalism category too in the modern quilt uh, show. So just, just follow those main three things. Frances McLeod is asked, can you give a quick explanation of stabilizer and when to find it? So in quilting and in bag making, we call it stabilizer. In sewing, we called it interfacing. It's just something that you sew your fabrics to or press iron your um, fabrics to, to give it more bulk. So if you're doing embroidery, if you're doing something that's going to have a lot of friction on it, um, or if it's a shape that can easily get out of whack, that's when you use a stabilizer. So there are, there are leave-in, that means it's going to stay with your, your object forever. There's wash away and there's tear away. And I think those are pretty self-explanatory how you use them. So you, you do whatever you're doing and then you tear away the tear away stabilizer and you just add water for the water soluble stabilizer. And they come in different weights. So they come in heavy, medium, light, and I believe there's an extra light as well. So it depends on what you're doing. It depends on what results you want. Uh, for instance, if they're used a lot in embroidery, they're used a lot in bag making, and we don't use them quite so much in quilting. We often will use the iron on, um, what is that called? Steam away or the flexi fuse just to get our applique patterns in place. So I know in English paper piecing now, they've got some stabilizer in the shape of the paper pieces. Um, we're talking English paper piecing now and they've got them so that they stay in there. I know Emma from my vintage sewing box uses a stay in stabilizer there. So um, experiment with you, uh, with them. I know of a couple of situations where people have used stabilizers in some blocks and they haven't used it in others. And you've got the problem that this doesn't shrink, the place that you used a stabilizer or it shrinks less than the rest of the quilt. And then you get a wonk in it. But then I've also seen some absolutely gorgeous work done with stabilizer as well. So um, experiment. It's just a, I, I realized this year with my embroidery unit, as I've got it going, I, I had to buy all the stabilizer because you, you just need it constantly in different weights. And I understand also in embroidery that in some situations you may even layer multiple layers of stabilizer together. It's not just one that you use. So it's a journey if you intend to use them. You haven't stated why you're using it, but that's what stabilizer is. Uh, somebody has said, I usually create my own patterns. That is always a challenge without software program to do my calculations. Would you recommend an intuitive software package for a hobbyist? Well, there's Prequilt. That is a fairly fast and easy one to get up and running with. It's an online app so that you don't need to download any software. But to play with package, um, like if you're just making quilt designs, you can go into Canva. Um, Illustrator is a fairly expensive program to use, but you could just use pen and paper. You don't need to use a computer at all. Just get some graph paper. I recommend the one that has four blocks per inch. So it's easy to grow the pattern and calculate how many inches things are. Um, and just work that way with pencil crayon and pen and paper. Yeah. <laughs> Two people has asked, do I have a favorite brand or brands of rulers and why? Non-slip is rather important. Would you consider doing a video on standard rulers? Um, 
quilter select and creative grids so many people have different favorites for a variety of different reasons some people have a favorite because of the size of the lines some people have favorites because of the color of the printing some people have favorites because of the shape so my favorite ruler is an 18 by two and a half and I believe it's OmniGrid. It might be Ofa. I'm actually not sure, but it's yellow printing on it. And I'm pretty sure it's OmniGrid. And that's what I like to use. But I do like to use Creative Grids. And I do like to use Ofa. My, I have a five, four and a half inch Ofa that I use for my small squares. And I swear by it. It's got nice fine lines that you can see the edge of the fabric underneath. And it gives me the results I want. Anytime something is not sticky enough, uh, one of my dollar store hacks from the very first one is just buy some first aid tape and put it on the bottom. It's uh, because we often buy a lot of templates that are just uh, CNC cut and they, they don't put anything extra on the bottom of it. So uh, you've got some odd shapes, whether they be uh, like the, the lemon peel or um, what is that quick curve ruler you know just put them on the back there and they stick really well um, so it, everybody has their own touch I know people really like their quilter select I personally have never used any of their products um, uh, any of their rulers I mean but I have a set of rulers that I really enjoy using and that doesn't mean that they're the best. They're just the ones that I enjoy using. So I have come across brands where the lines are so thick, you cannot get any accuracy. Um, they're, they're used for other types of crafts, but they look like, uh, uh, they look like the ones that we use for quilting, but they're just not appropriate for it. So find the ones that fit in your hands uh, properly you'll find as years go by you may gravitate to another shape this was really good at the beginning but now you only use this one um, or this year you're cutting a lot of blocks this size so this is the one I'm using um, for two years I made a lot of eight and a half inch blocks and through Angie Wilson of Gnome Angel uh, she directed me to a Marty Michelle eight inch square, which isn't very common for any of the other ruler makers. But the the ones for the block size that you're finishing, if you have a, a square ruler that you can square up, like if you're making a lot of six and a half inch blocks, like I did for the farmer's wife quilt, you want to be able to nice nice and easily trim up. You use that that ruler as a template. For straight cutting, I now have uh, a so tights magnetic system to do the long edges, and I really enjoy using that system with the magnets for long strips and uh, narrow strips. It, I find it has really, really made it easy. Made it easy. Didn't know. Okay, so some people say that my sound is too low. So okay, so let me just up the sound a bit. Okay, let me just speak a bit so can hopefully this will help. I don't know why this mic doesn't uh, come out as loud as I want it to sometimes. So, um, Megan Martin has said, I recently rediscovered some Elizabeth Hartman kits, Pineapple Farm and Penguin Party. Uh, those are fun. I've reviewed them and reread the patterns, but reviewing the Reviewing them gave me anxiety. Managing a complex project with a lot of steps and small pieces per block is overwhelming. How do I keep track of what I've done and what the next steps are? Should I cut and store all the tiny pieces or would it be better to cut as I go? Is there something I'm not considering that would help with the process? Those um, big projects with lots of little pieces in them I would not cut all the pieces ahead of time, mainly because you may get a couple blocks into it and realize you don't want to make this quilt. This is done. This is too fiddly. This is not the way you like to do it. So you have less fabric cut 
meaning they can go into that fabric can go into other projects. I do, I have, I have, it's been a while since I've done Elizabeth Hartman. Elizabeth Hartman did the aviatrix quilt that's on my spare bed um, in my sewing room on the Murphy bed. I have not done any of her other quilts, but I've done some from John at Art East Quilting, and his are somewhat similar, but not a little bit, a little bit funkier, I would say. Uh, they uh, like space bacon and uh, aerobics, aero, aerocats, aerobicats, I think it is. Um, so they they're always have just a little quirkiness about them. And when I did his trending quilt, I would just do one block at a time. And I would, I took a pillowcase. This is from my video, how to make some easy design walls, portable design walls. I would just take a flannel pillowcase and put some foam board, a sheet inside it. So I had a nice big board to work with. And I would just lay out all my cut pieces there. So I, I knew before I started that I had everything and everything was going to fit. And I, I knew the order like obviously you do A to B, B to C, whatever, and I could easily put them together and it could grow like that. Um, if you ever find a pattern that is too complicated or just sounds too crazy for you, don't worry. You can, you can rewrite the pattern to work the way that your brain works. Like if you like, you are a person who likes a lot of things to check off, just rewrite the pattern so that you have those steps that you can write off. If they're telling you make 12 of something, you can rewrite the pattern so that you're just doing one at a time. And our brains work so many different ways. Um, some people are visual, some people are have to read the patterns, some people like to do the math, some people don't like to do the math. So just because you don't like the directions of the pattern doesn't mean that you can't do it. Be flexible. Don't hesitate to rewrite it. You can go to your, your quilting buddy and have them check it for you to see whether it makes any sense, but do the quilt the way that you want to do it. So, um, as I said, some people like to make all the same blocks all at once. Some people pr prefer to take all the blocks that do it the same color way all at once. Some pr people prefer to do all the blocks that fit a particular row or particular fit a particular border at once. It's all the way that you want to work. So don't hesitate to change it. Uh, Renee Feltz has asked, is it too late to join the Iceland cruise? And no, it is not. Um, let me just here. I've got two trips coming up. I've got the fire and ice cruise and that's in June and July of this year. And in this uh, cruise, I am going to be teaching the Capella Cluster quilt. It, um, I have, I think I've done, I think I've made six different ways here. So I, um, I've just colored it some different ways, but I'm t what I'm teaching is the kaleidoscope block. Uh, we will be we will have quilt classes for five days. And in those five days, we're gonna go th thoroughly through all the potential of the uh, kaleidoscope block and all the wonderful arrangements that you can do with it. So I know that we have one person that's still looking for a roommate. So if you need a roommate, uh, one person is looking. And I, I think we've got three spots left, so, um, we're glad to have you with us. Um, the link to that is on my website. Just go to, let me just see if I can find that link. Uh, no, I do not have that link. What happened to it? <laughs> I apologize, but it's just on the cover of my website. It's uh, justgetitdonequilts.com and you'll see it right there on the homepage. Somebody has asked me, how do you calculate fabric for a mystery block of the month, 20 blocks? You can't really, unless you uh, just working that way, it's hard to give you an answer because 
blocks come together in different ways, in different shapes. You can have an approximate amount. Um, and uh, just work through that. Um, 20 blocks. I would more than likely start with a fat quarter bundle. If there's 20 blocks, I would start with 20 fat quarters. That's what I would do. If And if there's a background fabric, I would have two yards of that. And that's probably way too much fabric, but it will cover a lot of different issues that you might have. So if you have 20 fat quarters, you would probably have a variety of colors and you'll have a variety of patterns. So within the block of the month, the blocks that have the big pieces and the blocks that have the smaller pieces can all work. And then you would have the common background for everyone. But that's, that's the best answer I can give you without more details. Sorry. Diane Miller has asked, how much should I baste when I'm preparing to hand quilt? Um, I'm not a hand quilter, but I've certainly had to, I've seen people do hand quilting and I, I, I'm actually just going to refer to the group here. I'm sure there's some other hand quilters that can give a better answer than I can. And I know that I have some friends that would actually give their quilt to a long armor and they would do the, the basting just across uh, that they can simply tear out once they had done the hand quilting. So it's not something that you have to hand baste by hand as well. You can do that on your sewing machine and just do the big, big pieces across. Deborah Morton has asked, I have never used invisible thread in the bobbin to bind a quilt, but I've heard it's great. Have you? What type and weight of thread would you put in the top to pair with that? Um, I'm not sure if you're talking about uh, monofilament thread or you're just talking about Invisalign or something like that. I've never used anything lighter than 60 in my bobbin. But once you get down into the 60s, it's pretty, it's, and you know, it, if you choose a color that's similar to your background, it really does fade into the background. You get a sense of the texture, but you don't see the thread. So I would look at a gray or a brown and just choose it in a similar value to what your back is and just go that way. Give it a try. Um, the pre-wound bobbins I find work really well in my long arm. I've never tried them in my Berninas um, mainly because the bobbin, um, the bobbin size is different, but I do have some that I'm going to try in my older Bernina, my travel unit, and I really do like using them in my long arm. Um, Curious Knits has asked, do I ever applique? It's something she's never learned to do. Yes, I love applique. Um, it's just a matter of time and doing it. I don't necessarily, I don't do the traditional, um, like long stems and flowers and things like that. I do more, um, like hexagons and things like that. And I add them to quilts just to add a little bit of interest on the top. And I technically, I applique my labels on as well. Under the blue sky has asked, are retreats worth going to it? Should be offered or what should one expect during a retreat? So a retreat is just like a party. It depends on what everybody brings to it. So there, I have a retreat a group of people that I love going on a retreat with. And we've just booked one at a really nice inn who specializes in quilt retreats. They have quilters all the time. So they provide the irons, they provide the tables and the chairs and everything to do it. Um, and retreats can run different ways. I know people that get together in groups of eight and they go to a friend's cottage or they go to cottages that are oriented towards quilters. And they, um, there's a couple here in Ontario that I know of. Uh, so again, it comes back to what's everybody bringing? Are you going out for meals or are you staying in for meals? I went to a needle in a haystack in Pennsylvania on a retreat one time and 
though they supplied breakfast, did they supply lunch? Um, everybody was expected to be going out for dinner. And whereas the one that I'm going to down at the uh, Elmhurst Inn here in Ontario, they provide all the meals. You never have to leave the location at all. And it's not cheap. Like it's, uh, I believe our weekend is going, our three days. So we arrive on the Friday and we sew through Friday and sew through Saturday. And we have um, until the afternoon of Sunday is going to be over $500 but it's fun. It's fun. You get together and you don't have to worry about cooking or cleaning and you get to sleep in a nice bed and you see your friends and you don't have to worry about, uh, if you have children, you don't have to worry about them for the weekend and, and it's a weekend away. So it's up to you whether that's good money for you. Um, people go off to cottages and then you decide who's making the meals or are you going out for meals? So, um, whether you're going to play games, some people are game verse, uh, but games can be great icebreakers on the very first night. Uh, sometimes people bring prizes to give away at these things. Um, you, uh, sometimes you have shops that come in and, uh, do a little pop-up shop. So there's lots of different ways to do a retreat and, you can be as creative or not creative, <laughs> as creative or as simple as you want it to be. Um, I know Gina, who's here um, helping me uh, in the background here today. Uh, she was she was on a retreat a couple of weeks ago, and she uh, I think Gina, I think you said yours was done by Zoom. Everybody was sewing, but by Zoom. So you can do them lots of different ways. Uh, what was the name of the hotel? The hotel was called the Elmhurst Inn. It's in Ingersoll, Ontario. So that's between here and London, Ontario. And they are, they book quilting retreats all the time. And I think they can actually deal with three different sizes of groups. Uh, somebody's asked, why don't quilters use zigzag to finish binding? There's nothing to say that uh, using a zigzag is wrong other than uh, zigzag has a more open stitch so it, um, it just folds over differently and yeah some people it's a lot easier to keep a quarter inch seam when um, you're just sewing with one stitch but there's no rules against you doing it that way and a lot of people actually use zigzag um, to just do a fancy stitch to attach the binding on the other side. So just get yourself a nice embroidery thread and it looks great. Okay, we've got a minute for a couple more here. What is the trick to lining up equilateral triangles together so that the sides points match when sewn? Okay, so the trick. Do I have my, my little... So when we sew straight stitches, we get to align our seams and we know where the beginning is and we know where the end is. Uh, it is, so when we sew, like we put our two pieces together, let me see, when we put our two pieces together and we have a seam like here, we just match the two seams up here and here. When you're doing an equilateral triangle, that's the one where all three sides are the same size and the angles are all the same. So this is where things need to match up. Not here, not there, not there, but right here. And those are the important points that you need to mark. And when those line up, everything else lines up because sometimes these the, you don't have a complete tip. And this is not a half an inch. So that's what you need to, that's the, the real trick to equilateral triangles is the trick to most triangles. So what you can do is a couple of different things. You can make yourself up a template for the actual size and then just mark those points and then be careful to pin those. Um, or you can, uh, I'm not sure if they have templates with the little pinhole where you can uh, mark them that way. 
but that's the point that you need to be careful of. It's where um, the intersection's pr probably not where you think it is. Is using a ruler foot with templates worth the expense? Well, it's worth the expense if you are wanting that look. The rulers will give you a cohesive, like a, a as opposed to doing something freehand or doing something with rulers, you'll get a more consistent result with rulers. Doesn't necessarily mean that's better. Some people like the organicness of doing it slightly different every time, but if you like that precision, if you like that look, if you want something that looks all the same and the same measurements, yes, it's definitely worth it. Okay, I am just going to grab one randomly here. Uh, how do you pick a backing fabric? Um, I did a video on uh, piece backing and um, I should say on backing colors and you just want some color. You can choose, honestly choose anything that you want on the back. And in the past, many people believe, have believed that you just bought the cheapest sheets you can find and use those. These days we're looking for something that just is more cohesive with the quilt. Uh, so that if you fold it back, you can actually see uh, a complementary color on the back. So it d just depends, it depends on what your front looks like. I, I, I would almost immediately say don't do white, but if you're, you're, the background on the front of it is white, that might be the best color that you choose. So just find something that's kind of cohesive with what's on the front. Um, I'm doing one right now that's very, very bright and um, sort of color bursts with a front that is, um, it's not a perfect match, but I have decided that I am using up my stash when I can. So sometimes I, I really feel I get it. I get it really on the nose and sometimes it's not until it's all together that I realize, ah, oh, I could have chosen something a little bit better for that. Um, but I would choose something in the same family, but again, you may not want to spend the extra, if it's a queen size quilt, you, you probably will need at least four yards. So you may not want that at ex added expense and you can just go the route of a sheet in, in a similar color. So that's that. I want to welcome some other members of my quilt crew. Uh, we got Marquis, we got Mama Koala, Rachel Jones, uh, Neil, Pearl, Jessica, Gladys, home, Donna, uh, Diane, and Barbara Lee. Now, if you saw that evergreen, um, you saw the evergreen pattern that I had that is free with this, uh, a free download with this pattern this month. Um, I am going to have a free class within the, my uh, Karen's Quilt Crew this month. It's on the 28th of April and we will just be having a paper piece class. I'm gonna show you how to make that block um, or we're just gonna stitch and chat and make them together. So if you're interested in learning how to paper piece and you just want to start small, uh, come join our crew. And we do have a uh, stitch and chat this weekend. Um, I'm pretty sure it's 630 this time. We have been flipping it from 11 o'clock to 630 the second Sunday or the first Sunday of every month. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, Gina. <laughs> um, just in case you have not seen um, here we go. We've got, uh, this is the video just went live yesterday on foundation paper piecing. Uh, if you, let me just turn these on here. Um, it's everything you need. Uh, a lot of tips and tricks that I've learned along the way. And why would you ever want to do paper piecing? So, it just helps you with these beautiful, precise designs. Uh, the I also have my QuiltCon haul. What did I come home from QuiltCon with? I shared it with everyone. 
And over on Karen's Quilt Circle, this week I have Brian Maloney from Sewing Parts Online. Uh, if you have an old machine or a vintage mach machine, this company specializes in helping you get straight. Uh, funny enough, the part that's most often, uh, they sell most often, is the foot pedal and the power cord. And I had a absolutely wonderful chat with Stephanie Canada. No, she's not Canadian, uh, but she specializes in vintage patterns and uh, has expanded into fabric. And she is just a wonderful lady. She's just bought, um, she bought an estate and you just have to listen to the story of it. It's just, <laughs> just so much fun. <laughs> Anyways, I think that's it for today. Um, Yes, if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to join the circle and join in our Stitch and Chat, and you can ask them then. Um, I'm just going to get back here. So, um, our next our next crew is the first, I should say, our next, um, let me see. Sorry, I'm just having a little bit of a moment here. So thank you everyone for showing up today. Thank you, Gina, for holding the fort down over there. Uh, we have those links if you need them. Uh, if you are interested in that Stash Buster number one fabric, uh, don't hesitate. We've got a couple left over. And remember, it's not my site, it's my husband's. <laughs> you might want to pick 